Hello and welcome to Jet Set Social. My name is Ashley Colburn and tonight in Los Angeles we are live and it's everything about travel. So as you can see, this is just the beginning stages. The event hasn't started yet, but people are starting to arrive. And look it, we have some amazing sponsors here. Amazing Thailand, imagine that. Hello, how are you? Good, thank you, and you? I'm very good. Okay, so I have to say, of all the places I've been to in, in the world, Thailand is one of my favorites. Thank you. How many times have you, gone, have you gone? Just once. I visited Bangkok and Chiang Mai, but I actually wore this outfit. No, you didn't. I did. You did? You I did. You put this on yes, right now? I would. There you go. Oh, it takes me back to Thailand. Look at this. Now, what yeah, do you have here? Gift for you. It's a garland that she just provided wow. for you. So you guys are even showing, you are showing everyone attending here a little piece of Thailand. Yes, of course. We have information on the place and everything that you need to come by and access. So in Thailand, what is your favorite place? Bangkok is my home, so that's one of my favorite places. Actually, the only one, actually. Some of the best markets and shopping I think I've ever been to. Pretty much. It's, things are cheap in Thailand, you know? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to give this back to you. We're going to keep making our way to the red carpet. Thank you Excited to learn more about Thailand tonight. Come by. Okay. All right, so let's go see. Look at here. Here she's making them. Oh, my gosh. Look at all of those. Now, if you haven't been to Thailand, you will see these garlands everywhere. What do you think? Are you going to get one? They're gorgeous. <laughs> Which one do you think you want to get? Oh, I don't know. I, I love the little wreaths. These are so beautiful. Well, I'll give you some advice and go and smell all of them, and you'll want to take all of them home. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so look at this. We have some authentic music from Thailand as well. Hi. Now, we're going to have to ask them later the names of these instruments. So can you tell me, what's the name of this instrument? This one is called the Renat Egg, or, or you can call it a Thai xylophone. And that one over there is the Kim, or a Thai dulcimer. Well, it looks like a challenge to play, is it? Well, it takes some practice, but I'm sure you know anyone could master it with some skill. Well, I love it. Here at Jet Set Social, we're really getting a piece of Thailand. Yes, we are. <laughs> All right. OK, let's look. More people are arriving. This is great. Hi, what brings you here tonight? I'm here with the Thailand booth. Oh, you're here with Thailand too? Thailand booth, yes. That's great. So I take it you've been to Thailand several times? Yes, uh, about 30. 30 times. That must be a record. 31st. All right, well, make it in 2012, OK? I will, for sure. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so. We are going to make our way to the red carpet. We're getting closer to the time where every some of the top travel professionals are going to be sharing their tips. We're going to learn about social media, how it affects the travel industry. So the Oscars is not the only red carpet event that is taking place tonight in Los Angeles. We have our own red carpet right here. I have a question, guys. Are you ready for Jet Set Social? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so these are some of the top travel professionals in the world that are coming here to share their tips and what they recommend. So, Johnny. Yes. Johnny is a friend of mine. Johnny, every time I check, Johnny Jet is on a plane almost every day. <laughs> is it uh, every day? <laughs> almost every day. Every three days. So, Johnny, you obviously are an expert in budget travel. Now, do you think that this is one way that, and the only way that people should look before booking their next trip? Budget travel? Yeah. No, you gotta look at everything. Everything. Sometimes a first class fare could be cheaper than a budget economy class. Did you hear that? First class cheaper yeah. than economy class. Or it could just be a little bit more expensive. You never know. Okay, so Johnny Jet, if you're not following him on Twitter or Facebook or have visited johnnyjet.com, you must because and by the way today there's an airfare from new york to singapore for 655 dollars round trip you can't beat that it's actually it costs more to stay home so, really seriously you can't no you can't you're traveling to the other side and of the it's world on delta so you can get uh you can get about 18,000 mileage points freaking fire points just from that one flight so are you pretty excited for the event tonight i'm speechless Speechless. He's speechless. Okay, we're gonna thank you, Johnny. We're gonna move our way down the red carpet. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Now, what brings you here to Jet Set Social this evening? 
Well, I'm on the panel. Uh, I'm with CTS Travel, and I oversee the or entire division that does all celebrity and VIP travel. Okay. So tonight is a night of celebrities in Los Angeles. Yes, yes. It's actually, ironically, a night that I almost kind of get off because of the fact that everybody's already where they need to be. But you decided to be here with us. Absolutely. Well, we can't thank you enough. And do you have a book coming out? I do. Uh, I do have a book coming out this summer, Celebrity Stays and Getaways. Uh, it's all the top 100 celebrity places to go around the world. So tell me, where do you think, or, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of destinations celebrities are dying to go to, but is there one that you have noticed they tend to be going to this past year or so? Um, I do notice a lot of times with my VIP, like the big name celebrities, they like to go places that are very remote. So I have been doing a lot with the Maldives okay. lately. Mm -hmm. So privacy, find an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Absolutely. And you can't be reached by paparazzi, yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. We're Thanks. so happy to have you here tonight. Thanks. All right. Stacy. Yes, Ashley. Now, Stacy is an expert when it comes to hotels. Hotels and resorts. Hotels and resorts. Okay, so Stacy, tell me, of all the places, hotels, that you've stayed at in the world, do you have a favorite? I would say any Orchid Resort and Escape Hotel, because that's part of what I do. <laughs> but I think it's one of those crazy questions when someone asks you, what's your favorite restaurant? Do you want Japanese? Do you want sushi? Do you want Mexican? Do you want Italian? Mm -hmm. So I think it kind of... You have to go with the vibe of what you're in the mood for, I think who you're with, mm -hmm. and what that whole experience you're looking forward to. Do you want to sit on a beach? Right. You know, you can shoot to Tahiti. If you want a quick flight, you can shoot to South Beach, things like that. Or if you want something more exotic and you really want to go soul searching, hit Thailand, mm -hmm. something like that. So if you want to go to a place where you think that you can experience the most culture or living like a local, I know a lot of people are trying to, to get that feeling when they're going abroad. If they're spending all of this money, they really want to have that cultural, living like a local experience. Where, where would you recommend? Well, I would probably suggest sometimes in your back door. You know, I live in New York City right now. Sometimes I say, I'm going to take this weekend and do a staycation and do everything that, you know, everyone comes to New York to do, and I've never done it. Okay. Same thing sometimes if I go to San Francisco, you know, mm -hmm. but I like to find something, you know, off the beaten path, like finding ultimate finds, where it's not everything in your face right. when you open up a magazine, but it's, you know, finding your way, you know, with the unique, the uniqueness of what makes that city. Hence the fact when you're on social media, mm -hmm. you can find these little perks and little tweaks and little things like that that make it more exciting and things that you wouldn't know about by opening up your usual travel guide. And social media, it's just a click of a button and you can say what you like, dislike, or you know why people should come to that hotel within a second. Absolutely, and by doing a quick search, it even makes it that much easier yeah. to find. Well, thank you, Stacy. Um, we're so happy to have you. And we're gonna hear more from Stacy later on this evening when we have our panel. Thanks, so. All right. Okay, moving on. <laughs> You're next. You're okay. next on the red carpet. All right. Okay, so Lee, is the youngest person to have been to every country in the world. That's what they tell me, yeah. So I know that this is a really hard question because I get this question and I haven't been even close to the amount of countries that you've been to. Let me guess, what's your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> yes, what is your favorite? Do you uh, have one? It's so hard to pick a favorite when you've been to so many places, but uh, I would say I love Australia, Namibia, <laughs> Bolivia. Those are some of my favorites. Okay. Great places to be. Now, would you say that's because they have a variety of environments you know it's not just beach and desert you know you can kind of get a little bit of everything yeah exactly you can get a little bit of everything great people food and uh, they have really good adventure activities which is what i really like to do now i drove in the same car here with <laughs> lee and i asked him when he was going to be leaving los angeles and he responded <laughs> i don't know yet now maybe some of our viewers might be the same way, but I know I have to always plan trips way in advance. <laughs> you really just book a one-way ticket? I hate paying uh, cancellation or change fees more than anything, so I usually just book one-way tickets uh, unless I'm on just a real specific itinerary. But when I come out here, I have a lot of friends out here too, so I like to stick around. And uh, I don't know, I just like to be flexible. Now, you also said that you might go to Thailand next week. 
Uh, yeah, I'm actually weighing a couple different options, uh, but Thailand is uh, definitely one of them. I haven't decided yet. I'll decide probably by tomorrow. We'll see. Well, if you just go over there, you can hear a little Thai music, get yeah, yourself yeah. some garlands, and for all we know, we can check out online to see if you're there next week, right? Absolutely. It'll be on my blog and Facebook and Twitter and the whole thing. So, right. yeah. Well, we're happy to have you here, Lee. We're going to hear yeah. more from Lee later on this evening. So, well, thank, thank you. you. Very much. All right, and we've got one more here on the red carpet. Jeff, how's it going? Hey, Ashley, how are you doing? I'm very good. Now, this is the Travel Squire, I correct? Am squire, yes. Now, being a Travel Squire, what does that mean? Um, it means that um, we give advice and we write some great stories on TravelSquire.com. Now, what do you think is the best advice to give a novice traveler? Well, I think the advice that we try to give is all about validation. So everybody thinks they know where they want to go, but then when they're ready to book, they go, where should I go? So basically we take their choices and we help them decide. And that's, that's how we do it. It's easy. Now, where are you from originally? I'm from New York. You're from New York. So, like so how does it feel? We have a lot of New Yorkers here this evening. How does it feel to be here in Los Angeles? Well, I love Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, it, it starts out every day. Uh, it started out today bleak, mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful day right now. It's always beautiful in L.A. I love it here. It's all, the sun's always the shining, sun's always especially shining. today with all these red carpet events. Exactly. <laughs> Who wants to be at the Oscars? <laughs> we have it all going on right here at Jet Set Social. Exactly. So do you have a trip coming up? Well, um, in January, I was in London, I was in Florida, and I was in uh, Shanghai. And in, and in February, I was in Tokyo, I'm here in Los Angeles, and I'm going to Montana. So um, I, I haven't anything planned until April, which is a cruise of, of Croatia, and also going to Greece. So I have to tell you, I just got back from living in Croatia for three months. Oh, you did? Maybe you can give me some, you can be my therapist, the Squire's <laughs> therapist. Well, tonight during the panel, I'm sure I will add a few words in and out of uh, Croatia because I'm a huge fan. So well, you can ask me later too, and I'll tell you anything and everything of Croatia. I can't wait, Ashley, because I'm, you know, it's my dream trip. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank we'll you. hear more again tonight at the panel. Thanks. Now, as you can see, more and more people are arriving. And in just a little while, we are going to be talking about social media, the travel industry, how it affects. I mean, honestly, in the click of a button today, you can say whether you like, dislike a hotel, a country, and really anything when you're on your adventure. So we're looking forward to hearing from these professionals and the travel industry experts to see uh, what else we can learn. So let's take a look down here. We have more and more people arriving. We're going to have some cocktails and some, some snacks later on. So look at we have Malaysia here as well. Let's go on over here to Malaysia. Hello. Oh, <laughs> Tours of Malaysia is here at Jet Set Social, and we have some viewers that are streaming live from around Hello, the world. <laughs> so what are some of the top things that you would recommend doing in Malaysia? Well, actually, Malaysia, Malaysia has a lot, a lot of things to do. So it's so that everything under the sun can be experienced in Malaysia. So if you want to go diving, we have like the top diving sites in the world. If you want to go shopping, there's a lot of places to go shopping. Um, ecotourism is really big. So there's hiking, there's climbing the high, like my highest uh, mountain in Southeast Asia, um, KL, which is right here actually. They have the tallest twin towers in the world. So there's a lot to do for everybody. So there's something for all ages, you'd say? Yes, as well? definitely. If you want to go to the beaches, we have the beaches, we have spa, like everything is there. Okay, great. Well, thank you for coming here to Jet Set Social. We appreciate it. Okay, well, let's go and see what these are. Oh, ah, Groundlink. Hello. How are you? Thank you for coming here to Jet Set Social. Yeah, I'm going to come back here. Uh, get your way over here. I know. So this was my driver here to Jet Set Social tonight. He got me here safe and sound. So tell me a little bit about Groundlink. Groundlink is the world's first global car service. We're available in all 50 states and 110 countries and 5,000 cities around the world. So you're saying that when my plane lands in, let's say, Thailand, maybe not Thailand specifically, Absolutely but in Bangkok, we do we do service there every week. Oh, great. So as soon as as soon as they as soon as I were to arrive, you would get me wherever I wanted to go. Exactly, we would pick you up at any pretty much any airport in the world. 
Great. So Ground Link is available on mobile. So this is our mobile app, sort of blown up for the iPad. Uh, but you can pretty easily go in and uh, schedule your ride. You pick where you want to get picked up. You want to get dropped off from here, let's say, to LAX. Mm -hmm. uh, when do you want to go? Should we go tomorrow? Sounds perfect. All right, we'll go tomorrow uh, at 7 a.m. It's kind of early. And uh, then we're going to get a whole range of different vehicles you can choose from, from a basic economy vehicle, which is only $69. It's only about $10, $12 more than a taxi. Or if you want to, uh, if you want to go in an SUV, you want to go in an eight-passenger limo. We can. That's what you need. Yes. So we'll take care of that for you. And then uh, you go ahead and place the order, and, and that's it. We're guaranteed on time, so we will always be there to pick you up. So is the app called Groundlink? The app is called Groundlink. Okay, so we all know we don't travel nowadays without our iPads or our iPhones. Yep. So everybody right now at home should download go Groundlink. To the, go to the uh, Apple App Store or go to the Android Marketplace and download the Groundlink app. Perfect. I'm going to do this. This right. is very beneficial, especially for the... Global travelers like yourself. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Groundlink's the way to do it, so thank you. Absolutely. Thank Enjoy you. this evening. We will. It's going to be a night of fun. I can just feel it. Listen, we have music, garlands, you name it. <laughs> have a great evening. <laughs> you too. I would like to hand the mic over to Amy, and she's going to start our panel. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's great to be here, and what an esteemed panel we have tonight um, on a topic that I think everyone can be really passionate about. So I know that everyone has read each of your bios, but personally, I always like to know how people describe what they do so that the audience can get a sense of kind of the breadth of your blog or your agency or your site and also what drew you to travel. Everybody always has a good story about what draws them to what they do. Lee, do you want to start? Sure. Great. Um, I just kind of fell in love with travel. Uh, I went abroad when I was a junior in college. I'd never left the country before and then uh, I just was hooked. And since then I've traveled to every single country in the world and uh, I'm uh, actually the youngest American to ever do that, so I'm very proud of that. That's impressive, yeah. right there. Yeah. And you, you're, you are um, cataloging that on a blog. Yeah, yeah, leahbamonte.com, and I also contribute to a lot of different media outlets and uh, television, and, and that's what I do, and I'm hoping to uh, get my own television show and uh, working on a book as well. And what's your angle with when you travel to a country? Do you try to distill what the best things to do are, or how do you approach it? Uh, yeah, whatever there is to do in the country, whether it's go on a safari or climb a mountain or go to a beautiful beach or eat whatever there is to eat that's special to that country or, you know, drink a beer or a crazy alcohol or whatever it might be, I try to do... Nobody likes to do that. <laughs> I just try to do whatever there is to do, so I feel like I've really experienced what there is to experience, but I always leave time because sometimes places really uh, surprise you and then you want to spend more time, and, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what I do. What a good job. Yeah. Great, Johnny Jet. Um, you know, I grew up in Connecticut too, actually. We grew up about 20 minutes away from each other. We just figured that out tonight, which is pretty cool. But I used to be afraid to fly, actually afraid to leave the house. You couldn't get me out of the house from 18 to 21. It's a long story, but I was uh, diagnosed with asthma. My doctor gave me too much medication. They gave me anxiety. So basically, my, it was terrible. And. Um, I got over my fear, long story, came out to school here in California. I basically dated a girl who was like a princess. She only flew business class or first class. I never knew what that was like. <laughs> and she invited me, her parents lived all around the world. She invited me to Singapore the first year, and I, I didn't go. I was afraid to go, because even though I was over my fear of flying, I still wasn't afraid of my, over my fear of leaving the country. I didn't know if I'd be able to breathe in Asia. <laughs> and, and, or there'd be a hospital Legitimate. there, yeah. So anyway, the next year she invited me to Hong Kong, and I wasn't going to sit in the back of the bus while she's up front. So I had to figure out a way where I can get a business class ticket for the same price, for cheap. And I did it, and that's where I really started researching stuff. And I did that flight, and I'm telling you, it's the best time to have your first out-of-coach experience flying Trans-Pacific. It was amazing. I got there. I fell in love with Hong Kong, fell in love with travel, got addicted to my miles. I came back. After college, I started working at a college as a college recruiter, and everyone quit when I took the job, so I started getting all the best territories. Usually you're just driving around, but
but I started getting Hawaii three times a year in 26 different states. And I just started learning all these different tricks on how you could fly up front or stay at a really nice hotel for cheap. And I started sharing it, but this is back when the internet was brand new, 1995. And I started sharing it with all my friends, with emails, and I created a website. My nickname, my nickname growing up was Johnny Jetski, because I used to jet ski on Long Island Sound. And so they're like, you need to come up with a name. So I was like, you know, I'm not Polish, so how about Johnny Jet? <laughs> and um, so that's, that's how I started, and I got really lucky. The first Laura Bly from USA Today wrote about it in 2000, and that was my big break. Once she wrote about it, it went everywhere. My friends would call me up and say, turn on the TV right now, you're on CNBC is Power Lunch website of the day. I'm like, you're joking. And so it just started blossoming, and I had students help me create the website. And it just kind of, people were asking me for interviews and TV, and now I have a TV show on the Travel Channel called Hot Spots 2012. It airs next month. Congratulations. Thank you. And now I visit at least 20 countries a year, and I'm actually trying to do what this guy does, go to every country <laughs> in the world. I got, I got some work to do. So your site focuses on sort of level jumping within the travel industry, getting more for your money. It's, it's basically everything. You know, when I started, my goal is just to get people out there and see the world. I know what it's like to be afraid, to not want to leave. I, truly, as corny as it sounds, I, I think the world, world would be a better place if everyone got out and saw the world. You know, don't stay in your own little corner. And it's different. And so basically, when the internet came out, no one wanted to link other websites. So I was like, well, I just want to show what's out there for everybody. So I just created a page that had everything, guidebooks, every single one, Farmers, Lonely Planet, Rick Steves, for uh, online travel agencies, Expedia, Orbitz, Travelocity, you name it. Did you intend to make this a business, or was it no. just a passion? No, it was just, it was just a passion. I had no idea. If people told me I'd be up here right now and I'd be making money, I'd be like, you're crazy. And I have a TV show on the Travel Channel? No. I'd never, ever imagined that. But in the back of my head, it was always like a goal or a dream, not a goal. Yeah, nice work. Thank you. Great, Stacy. Well, I kind of got started on a fluke. I think how everyone just kind of falls into, excuse me? Uh, louder. I just kind of fell louder. into what I'm doing now when I look back at kind of how I started. I remember, you know, when I was young, I always wanted to live in New York City. And I did an internship at home. I'm from Fort Lauderdale. And I did an internship and ended up getting a job in New York City at the Parker Meridian Hotel in New York. And it was my first hotel job, sales. Didn't really know what the word sales really meant. I was used to thinking, you know, vacuum cleaner, door to door, you know, things like that. And I don't own a vacuum cleaner, so I would never sell or buy one of those. But if I was to sell Swiffer, I could sell anything out of Swiffer because I think it's the greatest thing. But the night before I moved to New York, a friend of mine took me to the Delano Hotel, which is in South Beach in Miami, which is owned, well, was owned by Ian Schrager at the time, who launched Studio 54 back in the days in New York City. Um, I, you know, I was 21 years old, had no idea who Ian Schrager was, very naive, didn't know anything what happened at Studio 54. But I saw this hotel, and I thought it was the most amazing place I'd ever seen in my life. Walked in, had dinner there, and it was, again, the night before I moved to New York. And I said, I would work for this guy for free. I worked at the Parker Meridian in New York for two years. Two years to the day, I got a phone call from the, the number two to Ian Schrager, and they were opening up a hotel in New York City, a new one. It's now called the Hudson Hotel. And they were looking for an associate director of sales. So I moved into that. I then opened up that hotel. I worked for Ian for four years. I launched his global sales office, uh, representing all his you know, whimsical hotels, you know, New York, Miami, London, and LA. So the Mondrian out here in LA. And then I was then brought on to bring on the whole Gansevoort Hotel Group. So I launched that in New York. And then um, I was opening up all these things for other people and having so much fun doing it. Uh, I then started to get the idea of, let me launch my own group where I could represent four and five star boutique hotels where I think as you get older, you kind of feel like where you want to stay, what you like, finding a great cost too. And getting there, you know, business and first is nice to fly to. Um, 
So I ended up uh, starting my own group called Orchid Resorts and Escapes, and we represent four and five star boutique hotels all over the world that are independently and privately owned. But we mix in uh, a unique sense of a spa aspect and a food and beverage aspect to all of the hotels. So when someone's staying at an Orchid hotel, they know what to expect, what they're getting, because they're all independently owned. It's not part of a huge group that's a brand name. So they hire you to do the sales and marketing for them because they're not part of a conglomerate. Exactly. And we personalize them. And they're smaller, boutique-ish type of properties where they don't have you know, the funds that a Mandarin, a Four Seasons, a Marriott may have. And also by that, we also help them with their social media side with you know, the Facebook, Twitter, a small world, things like that, and building, you know, building different ways to work with different companies in a faster, quicker way yeah. of other like-minded individuals. And in of that. course, we'll talk about social media tonight Absolutely. as it's critical these days. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Well, um, I started out in the world of fashion and magazines, um, and I went to school for Syracuse University for uh, journalism, and never really did that. I fell into advertising. So I did that for about 15 years, and um, worked at Connie Nast for years. I worked at Connie Nast Traveler, and I worked at Vogue and GQ. and. Um, being on the advertising side is kind of interesting because you learn about the business aspect, but as there was a renaissance and Johnny kind of jumped on the bandwagon really early on, um, there were a lot of people out there blogging. Um, and I, I had done 15 years in, in magazines and I wanted to get into internet and I felt that internet was a place to be for travel going forward. And so, um, I looked at what was going on in the travel market, and Johnny has a great, um, great, great site, and he's he's doing something different from a lot of people. But aside from him, there's a lot of bloggers out there that are just just putting diaries out there. And I said, wouldn't it be great to take what I learned um, inside of Condé Nast and bring it to um, the web, um, the the internet world, and create a digital magazine with real journalism that was really professional, and and also took took all the, the benefits, like the, the, the video and all the things that you can, can get by being online. And that's how I created Travel Squire five years ago. And obviously, the market um, and, and web changes, and, and magazines aren't going to go anywhere, but um, digital is really important now for travel. And Travel Squire is firmly positioned after four and a half years as, as an entity that people are recognizing we have um, 40 writers who write for, for us, and they're all over the country, all over the world, in fact. And we cover um, topics all over the world. And we're going to a new site starting in March 7th, where we'll actually have more smaller columns. Because we, we started out with uh, very, very long columns, which were 2,500 words plus, um, which obviously for SEO and, and all of the web you need smaller articles, so we'll start to do all the things that Lee's doing, so maybe Lee will write for us. Um, in, in any case, um, we also have another part of the business, um, which is called the Travel Therapist, and it comes from my passion of helping people. Everybody wants travel therapy. They go away, they, they want to know, I'm going to Thailand, and I have three hotels that I like. Which is the best hotel? And there isn't a best hotel. It depends on your personality. And, um, and that's kind of what I was for years and years. I helped people with their, with their trips. And, and I took my passion, and I took my business acumen, and I took my, um, my travel skills, which I had been traveling for, for 25 plus years as well. And I knew the ins and outs. And I decided that I wanted to bring it all together. And that's how Travel Squire was born. Interesting that you took a traditional background and turned it sort of on its head into digital, which is, of course, kind of the dream for a lot of people. Great. Ashley. Hello. Uh, I'm Ashley Colburn, and I guess I can say that my travel itch, sort of like Lee, began when I studied abroad in Spain. And I actually, so I'm a TV host and producer, and I actually started out in news because I was told that if I wanted to do the TV route that you always have to start in news. And I'm very grateful for that because it taught me to be objective, work hard, you know, fast. And so I worked in Colorado um, 
for news for a few years, and then I'm from San Diego, so I moved back to San Diego and got hired as a host and producer at Wealth TV. And after hosting a variety of shows there from yachts and jets and cars, fashion, um, I, they were like, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to travel. So uh, the first show that I went to do was in Croatia. And kind of to jump forward, I did two seasons of a show called Take Off with Ashley Colburn. And it featured everything from, you know, lifestyle, culture, cuisine, adventure. But I guess you could say my niche is kind of the culture adventure part. I'm the person that, like, like the Thailand exhibit out there, the outfit with the hat and the jean top and, and pants, I wore that when I went to Thailand. I always wanted to learn the local dance, the folk dance, and, and put on uh, the authentic clothing. So I kind of just tried to show an inside look of the countries and hoped that people, when they watched my show, felt like they could go and do those same things. Nothing was too over the top, but um, was easy enough to follow my adventure, and I hoped that they would have a similar adventure when they went abroad as well. So season two, we shot in 3D, so that was a whole new experience as far as the production side. Bungie jumping off the tower in Macau, and I mean, I guess you could say I was really coming at you in the screen, so uh, whether you liked it or not. But um, then I recently actually started a production company, and uh, so Takeoff still airs on Wealth TV, but I recently was living in Croatia where I filmed an entire series about Croatia and um, it's seven one-hour episodes on seven different regions which is basically like seven different countries so I decided that the 30-minute travel shows weren't really for me in the fact that I was learning so much as an individual being there and as a traveler that I wanted to do the destinations more justice and, and Give and really have a viewer watch a show and understand that country and the culture and, of course, find that adventure along the way. So that's my story. Everybody has such a fun job. <laughs> <laughs> Can't complain. James. Hi, my name <clears throat> is James Densmore, and I am a part of CTS Travel. The division I run for CTS Travel is we do all celebrity and VIP travel. And I have a website, go to travelguy.com. And we, how we came up with that name is that I have a lot of celebrity clients that have called me over the years and said they've worked with so and so on a movie. And that person said that they, I was the person to call, that I was the go to person for them to call to book their travel. So kind of took that off and ran with it. Uh, I've been very fortunate that uh, my celebrity client base has. Grown. Most of them are standing on a red carpet tonight. So <clears throat> ironically, uh, everybody was asking me that tonight's actually one of the nights that I don't have to worry. Because um, <laughs> my phone actually never rings on uh, Oscar night. So <laughs> uh, everybody will be out and about. How I got into this industry uh, was I was around 20 years of age and I took an Iberia Airlines flight from JFK to Madrid. And <clears throat> I had never flown international, and I, from this point forward, thought that all travel international was gonna be like this flight, because when the plane took off and the fastest seatbelt sign went off, which was only about five seconds into flight, uh, the entire plane got up, and everybody was drinking and eating and smoking all over the plane, and I had never seen anything like that in my entire life, <laughs> where if you were sitting down, you were actually the odd person out. Uh, and when the plane landed in Madrid, everybody cheered and clapped. And I thought that all travel must be like this then because <laughs> I'd never seen this in the US. But it really gave me that taste of what the rest of the world was like and how excited people were to either go back to their native country or to be going somewhere new. So I ended up in the industry very shortly after People thought I was kind of uh, kidding when I said, I think I want to go do this. And I did. And I, <clears throat> my first job, believe it or not, was working in the travel department at the World Bank International Monetary Fund, which is a part of the United Nations. So I was really kind of thrown into diplomatic travel pretty quickly. And I ended up out in LA and kind of spun that and went with it more with celebrities. And <clears throat> now I probably have about so like half of like the top 10 celebrity names. And they 
have a lot of needs that the average traveler doesn't. They're not necessarily the traveler that's looking for something to be cost efficient. They're more looking for a certain niche, a certain amount of service. Um, that doesn't mean they're not cost conscious at the same time, but there is a lot more hand holding in that industry with dealing with celebrity travel. I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, travel used to be this thing where you would read Condé Nast Traveler, or you would talk to your travel agent, and now, I mean, hotels are tweeting, and the digital age has really transformed all of our experiences as it relates to not only booking travel, but experiencing travel and transparency. I'm curious, I mean, I'm curious what everybody thinks about this, but please jump in if you have a strong point of view. How, what do you think has changed because of the digital age, really, when it comes to travel, which has been so affected by it? Stacy, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I think it kind of goes, you know, in two different ways. I think... And for better or for worse? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I deal with luxury hotels and resorts, villas, chalets. So I get the celebrities. I work with CTS, I'm very lucky to say. So yes, you're looking for that person who's, you know, price might not be the issue, but the hand-holding and the special added value and the perks and the VIP feeling is what they're looking for. And a lot of times, they're the ones, honestly, and I'm sure you could probably maybe agree, they're doing their research too and coming to you and saying, have you heard about this place? And so it they might- they found something online. Found something online, found something through like, you know, even, to this day, like now I think more of like the Condé Nast Travelers, the you know, travel and leisure, it's all online now too. Right. Whether it's that, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it may be. But a lot of times the individuals are doing their research, whether they're looking for the very, very high end, they're then going to their travel agent and asking. Or if someone's not looking for their high end travel, maybe like someone where you're looking for, you know, I want to go here, I want that feeling of a high end vacation, but I want to see if there's something special going on for a specific time period. So that person may do it on their own. So they're also looking online for that too, if that makes sense. Yeah. Johnny? Could you give me the question one more time? Yeah. Sure. It's what, how do you think the digital age has affected travel since there's so for much sure. transparency now and you can know so much before you even call a travel right. agent? Yeah, in the old days, you had to call a travel agent or you had to have a stack of newspaper clippings from you know, the travel section or every single National Geographic magazine. I mean, I have friends who still have magazines and they go through them to find the research. I'm like, man, you're like Fred Flintstone. <laughs> so these days, obviously, and it's actually getting almost more difficult these days because when you're going to look for stuff online, there's so much out there. You don't know who you can trust. You know, there's TripAdvisor. But you don't know who's writing that review. It could be a disgruntled employee. It could be, you know, their sales team. So it takes it takes time to figure out. And I think that people have to. I think a lot of companies still have to realize or try to figure out how they can make sure people know they're going, they're getting stuff that's legitimate. Yeah, Lee. I think kind of what what he was saying is that's why I think blogs are so important these days because that's how you get a real sense. Uh, because you're not getting it from a random person like you might on TripAdvisor or some of these other review sites. You're getting it from a person. You can actually email them if you want, get a recommendation. I mean, I haven't talked to a travel agent since 1998, since I first started traveling. And because uh, the truth is, uh, I feel like I know more than they do because I've done the research or I've been there or been around. And, uh, you know, they're just trying to sell you on whatever hotel they're recommending or whatever. I disagree. Travel agents, I, I mean, I'm a, I've made my living on online, but there is still a good a great need for travel agents, especially for you know, those huge trips, honeymoons, cruises. Those guys can get you upgraded or a specialist. Let's say if you're going to China, go down here to Chinatown and find a travel agent here, and they'll get you the best deal because they sell the most tickets to China. Or go to Japan Town or, or Little Italy if you're going to Italy, things like that. And I, I think travel agents, and I think actually travel agents are making a comeback because the ones who were just writing tickets are gone. And now the ones that are still here, they know how to make money. They They're know curators. how, and they and they know how, they can help people. And, and if there's ever, let's say, you know, when the volcano happened in Iceland last year or two years ago, you know, when you're trapped there or there's a big snowstorm, you're on phone, on the on hold for five hours trying to get your flight changed. If you had a travel agent, you just call them up and they'll do it all for you. So that's the benefit of having a travel agent. I agree that there is a 
benefit in, in a niche market, kind of like that, like mm -hmm. especially for honeymoons, because I think that makes a lot of sense. But for someone like myself who does everything kind of on the ground, and I don't have a real plan generally when I travel, I like to do it all myself, and I just kind of figure it out as I go. And I can just as easily book the flights in and out. And if I'm doing one specific thing, maybe I'll call them, especially if I'm going to a difficult place or uh, maybe a place in the Pacific or you know, in Africa or something like that, and there might be a, a specific travel agent that focuses on that. It's good to bounce ideas off and see the price, but generally I like to do it myself. And travel agents don't want you to call them, by the way, for like a ticket from LA to New York. They don't want that. Interesting, yeah. Well, unless that's The travel here. agent speaks. Yeah. I had to take all that in for one second, but uh, <laughs> That's not necessarily true. And there are huge benefits to a travel agent, especially if you're using a travel agent that has preferred account status with a lot of the carriers. So like, we're a big agency, and we're also a virtuoso agency. So only the best agencies in the world are virtuoso. And we have preferred status with American and United and all these things. So when somebody's booking a ticket online, and now they want to get an aisle seat, and it costs them an extra $49, I can actually get that for free. Can and you explain can you explain Virtuoso for those who might not absolutely. know? Absolutely. So Virtuoso is a travel network. Um, it's kind of uh, like leading hotels of the world, for example. But uh, Virtuoso is a travel network of hotels and of travel agencies. And you have to meet all of the criteria for the travel companies. Um, and they're very, very strict. I mean, it's a, a very lengthy application process to be invited into Virtuoso. But then your clients obtain all of Virtuoso amenities. So these are all these great hotels all over the world. So they're going to get upgraded, and they're going to get breakfast, and they're going to get maybe a half off a spa treatment. But if they're staying at a Four Seasons, and they're going to get breakfast for two on a daily basis, that's $100 right there. So I mean, there is huge savings and benefits. And it doesn't necessarily just have to be at a Four Seasons. But I think there is a huge value to the, travel, to the travel agency community, actually. And it's come back around tenfold. Did you see the article in the New York Times last weekend comparing all of those different trips? And there was an online booking, and there was the travel agent booking, and all of them were better prices with the travel agent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in addition, we have a lot of contracts, and too. And so we have a lot of contract fares. I get waivers and favors all day long. And people don't always know what that means. But I, we have to be, due to the fact that we have these top account statuses, I can get you know, that 30-day advance purchase fare to Paris, that was 3,600 in business class, but it's gone now. But it's obviously because you want to go tomorrow. I can actually get that back. Yeah, you're so like it's the those little man. things, mm -hmm. yeah. How much does it cost? The 36, I can get that back, though. Yeah, but if it costs me to call you up. Oh, well, there's, yes, there is a fee, so obviously, <laughs> in our community. I mean, that's how we, that's how we feed ourselves. You don't do it for free? Yeah. <laughs> or so, you, okay. I think the digital age changed the whole the whole process. I mean this is interesting coming yeah. from a traditional guy yeah. who yeah. Well, I just think that people are more knowledgeable. In in yesteryear people went into a travel agent, let's forget the travel agent. They went in to book a trip or they called up the airline and they said give me I'm go I want to go to Spain and I want to go these days and that was it. Now somebody, and that's why we have the travel therapist, and we don't do any booking, because some people like to buy the tickets, some people like to go to a travel agent, some people like to go to a consolidator who, who you're sort of in between a consolidator and travel agent. So I just think that people are more knowledgeable, but they, they hone the information down, whether they get it in a, like I, I actually use in-flight magazines. I decided to go to Helsinki last year because of a, an in-flight magazine. I wanted to go there for the longest day of the year. But then I did my research on the longest day of the year and what, what things were going on. And then, then I decided how I was going to book it. And sometimes, you know, I book it through a fly.com and then I go directly to the airline or I go to a travel agent and I, I have to compare. But it's given more variables and it, it's, it's more empowering for the consumer because they get to see things that they never got to see before and it, and it helps them make their choices, I think. Yeah, so clearly for consumers, the digital age is a total resource and gift. But on the other side, how do you feel about online content producers, those of you who are not online content producers, do you see them as a partner or a resource? Are, is it a pain to have somebody come to you, James, and say, oh, but I saw all this stuff online. Is that, 
it, are you like the doctor and they come with like, yeah, it's an ear infection. And you're like, no, no, it's a sinus infection. I mean, like, like travel like, MD, right? Yeah. Is uh, it, is it <coughs> useful? Yes and no. I think there's a, I, mean, I think there's great useful to tools. Obviously, I use those tools all the time when I need to tell a client about something. So I'm obviously copying and pasting those links and those blogs and everything to send off to them to read about. So I think there's a, a huge demand, and I think that the information out there is getting better and better, even as time goes on. But I do like to go <clears throat> to go back to what you were saying about the digital, like the just the digital world. I mean, it's a it's a tool that we can't do our jobs now without it, and so it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. There are so many though. So you have sort of. Travel and Leisure's online site, and then you have a Jet Set Extra, then you have Boz Around. It's a mom traveling around with her kids, just cataloging her travel experiences. How does one navigate between those as a consumer or a hotel to figure out who's who, who's credible, who's doing good work? How do you sort through that? I think it takes time to trust people. I think you have to start following them and you know, I, I just don't think you go to a barber just because you're walking by. Mm -hmm. You're going to get a referral from a friend or a family member, and it, it, it's the trust thing. I think it's basically the same way. Yeah. Ashley? I think you need to know what you want, too. So if you are somebody that's going to be traveling with young kids, you're not even going to look at some sites. And back to, sorry, I didn't say this earlier, but back to the whole digital side of things, as far as video content is concerned, I mean, if you were to go online today and put um, the bungee jumping in Macau in the search engine, there's going to be a video of somebody doing that. So you can immediately see what you're going to see when you go there. So just reading about it in a blog, I mean, you might learn about somebody's experience or learn the ins and out of it, but you can actually see it. And I think that in video is one of the most um, fascinating things for people looking to travel because they can decide right and then, then and there if they want to do that. So going back to if you know what you want when you want to travel, then there's going to be different groups out there. You, a lot of young people want to backpack, and so they're not going to look up luxury travel sites and, and try to stay in the fancy hotels. They're going to go right to Hostel World. Yeah. So if so many people are seeing these real-time examples and getting such good resources and seeing the web as a partner, why do you think online content producers have a hard time getting a tourist bureau to fund a trip to Australia or getting a hotel to put them up so that they can write about the experience? I mean, those deals are obviously happening, but for a lot of really high quality curated content publishing sites, those aren't happening and it's really hard to get attention. I'd really like to hear from everyone on this. I think that, uh, I think that they, focus on the old media, they're a little bit slower to adapt than, um, you know, whether it just be a specific hotel or whatnot, but these tourism bureaus are tough to crack. You know, they want the Condé Nast, they want the National Geographic, they want that type of... They want somebody with a, with a print Right, partner. print traditional. Mm -hmm. They just don't kind of see the breath and it's harder to, um, you know, prove to them that you have X amount of hits per month or per day or whatever, and then they're like, well, who's actually looking? And this and that, it's just kind of harder to justify your success basically to to them so they you know pay five thousand dollars for you or whatever it might be for you to come and you know eat and drink for free for a week you know it's changing uh, I think it was 2005 I got invited to Morocco by the tourism board and I actually let's say 2004 first I got invited to New Zealand and I wanted to go and they're like oh you can't go you need to have a print assignment I'm like well I don't have a print assignment they're like sorry you can't go so I had to scramble and find one of my friends who was an editor to assign me a story in a, a glossy magazine. So I wrote it for it for that, and then actually, turns out, I also wrote it for my website, I brought more business with my website than it did in the print. But then the next year, I got invited by the uh, Moroccan Tourism Board to go to Morocco, and I said, well, do you want me to recommend any of my friends? I always do that, because I always try and travel with fun people. And so I started giving them names of like newspapers. They're like, no, I'm no, no. I'm going with you next time. Oh, and, and they're like, no, no, we don't want we don't want newspapers. We only want online. And I was like, are you kidding me? That was the first. It was 2005, 2006. And so you, it started to make a change. It's still not completely changed yet. But a PR firm brought me into the Israel Embassy a few years ago, and they wanted to have a to show the importance of bloggers to them because you know the head honcho is they only believe in print. So I gave a presentation and 
Next thing you know, they had a blogger's press trip three months later, and then they had one press pass to give to a journalist when the Pope was there, and they gave it to me, which was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and so it's definitely changing, but there are still some destinations that need to have me come in and talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> well, Stacy, of course, they have your ear. Do you, do you explain it or sort of advocate for, for bloggers and, and publishers? I mean, what is their view when they share it with you? There's a lot of different things, especially if you're looking at, you know, my internship, going back to that, I did it with the Fort Lauderdale Convention and Visitors Bureau. This was also back in 1923, I think when I was 21. Mm. So, I mean, by, you know, then it was like everyone's, you know, shuffling everyone everywhere, flying everyone everywhere, you know, United was giving tickets away, American was, there was no issues with that. Nowadays, everyone's looking at if you're going to have press there, if you're going to have the right editor there, if you're going to have the right salesperson there, who's then going to be able to spread that word to in, to in turn bring a huge ROI back into these hotel rooms? You know, so yes, right now, because everyone's looking at, you know, if someone's, you know, tweeting, you know, probably all of my hotels right now, unless you have 5,000 to 10,000 followers, you're probably not going to be asked to come. Our properties are very small, though. I'm not speaking for the big 5,000-room hotels where they have the rooms open to bring people in they're on actually, the bus load. They're actually harder. The, the, chain, the big chains are, are, the, are the hardest to, to work with. But, I mean, it, it's, it's, but it's different areas, I think, at different times. Like, if there is a, you know, going back to Iceland, now everyone's trying to bring everyone back to Iceland with everything that happened there, and they might have more of a push with the CVB there. But, you know, with our brands right now within our ORCID group, you know, our, uh, geez, I think our smallest property is 11 rooms and our largest is 157. You know, I need to be able to say, this person's going to be able to write about you here or blog about you there and this and that, not while you're there and say, I'm at the pool, I'm having a pina colada. That's not going to bring someone there to go, oh my God, that's the place I need to go when you have... 5,000 places to go all over the world. Why would I go there just to sit by a pool with a pretty picture with a pina colada in their hand? Some people will. Some people will, but I think you need a little bit more to keep going with that, with the kind of properties that our clients are looking for. Because that could be a generic picture. It needs something special to make someone want to go there. Mm -hmm. So if you keep that going, but then with us being on the sales and marketing side and the PR side, we have to show our clients, all right, this is someone new. They have a fresh outlook on it. They have the, this many people attached to their likes on Facebook or how many people are following them. You know, this is, sometimes you have to take a chance. You know, because, you know, properties now, you know, Four Seasons, Mandarin, you know, I used to think that's where my parents would stay. You know, now it's the 20-year-olds are staying there, but then also, you know, that word luxury is also a weird thing too. What does luxury mean? Is luxury, you know, going, you know, staying in a treetop and then bungee jumping down the tree and going down a zip line? Like, is that luxury? Sounds good to me. Yeah, I know, I well, know. I'm trying to mix it up so everyone's happy. Because it's over, it's like the word natural. It's exactly. It's so used that it's really hard to define what does luxury mean anymore. Um, I'm going to skip to James because I know you have to leave early to hobnob with Hollywood. But, I, you know, as, as somebody who has the ear of a traditional resort but who also has a site, where do you stand with it? <clears throat> well, I think I, 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 I agree that on the hotel side they have to be able to see what they're going to get out of value if they give away something like this to you. Is that my drink? Uh, <laughs> but uh, so I think they have to be able to see what their return on their investment is going to be. But I also think that you have to s just k start some type of relationship, whether you're going to be in that city already, and then maybe you ask if you can come by and have dinner. You have to start these relationships. Obviously, they're probably going to treat you to dinner. But the, y if you can start those relationships, you most likely, if they could see that there was, some, there was some hits or there was some feedback from even just having dinner and then you wrote about it, and you took a tour of the hotel, I probably, the next time you're in that city, they probably would treat you then to a night because they can see. But I think it's better, they, the hotels get hit so much with so many people asking for free requests. 
and the industry has changed so much. The airlines and the hotels don't give away things like they used to, and now they all have the points program. So if they're a chain, then people are wanting to already use free nights with points. So <clears throat> they need to be able to see the value for it, but they still do give a lot back to the travel community, I think, too. I mean, it's, it is marketing. You know, and then we, I get a lot of offers. I get sometimes more off, I get a lot more offers than I can take, actually. But you book celebrity travel. I mean, that is, that is such an easy dot c to connect, whereas you know, you'd have to look up somebody's Alexa rating, really, to see how much traffic they're getting and how valuable it is. Jeff? No, I, 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 I think it's a relationship, you know, and Alexa is wrong. <laughs> Um, and it, but it's what everybody uses, so we, we end up sending our Google Analytics out to prove mm -hmm. our traffic because that's my bank account here, take a look at it. But I think that when you start with these people, they always start like, what do you want? <laughs> um, convention bureaus. Yeah, it's, it's, and you can, you can see them like take the step back, whether you're at a trade show. And, and we find that um, we're here. We've been around for four and a half years, and don't you feel that every year it gets easier, where people people recognize you and they go, oh, they're still around. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a good thing, and and I think that it's a relationship, as as uh, you were saying, because I, I really think that once they feel like you're going to deliver for them, they'll they'll do something for you. There's so many people who are out there who are who are, who are scamming, and nobody likes to be burned with somebody on a trip or uh, hosted at a property, and then. And then you find out that they're, they're not even legit, let alone they're not even going to write the story that they promised. So I think the key is to, to, to be patient and also to deliver on what you say you're going to deliver, whether you get a stay or, or you get comp for the whole thing. Can I jump in? It's definitely happened. Like There's a lot of people. And it's such a small world within the hotel industry that you know people start jumping and doing you know, PR trips, and they get asked, or they ask to be asked. And it's a small circle, so you know there's certainly a lot of people out there that I know personally that say, well, they're freelancer, they can do this, they can do that, and they'll be you know blacklisted from several hotel groups, and they'll start talking, and that's now going on social media. Don't have this person, don't ever invite this person out to your hotel because nothing will be coming of it. So it's you know again, it's not that any you know, but there are a lot of scammers too. But I think it's you know doing a little research on who that person is too before just saying oh yeah come on out I'll do a you know a whole trip for you, but you never know someone's new fresh outlook on it could turn it around. It's getting tougher to scam people because, because of everything. If the PR you can people find. are smart, they would call up the editors, make sure that mm -hmm. this person works for them. They would check their, check their traffic. You could ask for their Google mm -hmm. an Analytics, things like that. So it's much tougher. And for writers, if they want to. Uh, get free trips or whatever, the best thing to do is to go to a conference like this or much or other conferences and get to know the PR people and the hotel people and establish a relationship like these guys said. And that's the best way and follow up. You always got to follow through. If you don't deliver, then you'll never be asked so back. So let's talk about what does delivery look like? So you write an article. Is video better than print? Does video always need to accompany print? Are you showing them how many likes that happened on Facebook? I mean, Ashley, you're on TV, so that's sort of a no-brainer. You report on it. Right. So to me, it doesn't matter really how many followers I have on Facebook or Twitter or likes. Uh, to me, it's what's the distribution, how many people are actually going to see my program. So another thing when it, TV production is involved is nobody really wants to turn on the TV and watch a show and have it be a big ad. So you have to be really careful when you're going around and working with tourism boards or convention bureaus because you don't want to lose the value of your show. Um, you also want to, you have a budget when you're doing this and you do want to be hosted. And I think the key word in journalism today is being a multimedia journalist. So it wasn't that long ago when I was in journalism school and you learn to do everything. So yes, I have Twitter, yes, I have Facebook, yes, I have a blog. So if somebody did want to look up my show and see if it really did exist, they'd see previews, they'd see where it aired, they'd see how many, uh, what the distribution is, and they'd also see that I was on Twitter and Facebook and those other social media sites. Now, the cool thing is, is while I, you know, while people are watching my show and they want to do a trip like, like they saw exactly on the on the TV, um, 
if they're following me on Facebook or Twitter, then they can see where I'm staying while I'm filming. So it's an immediate uh, advertising, I guess you could say, for those uh, hotels or um, adventure groups or whatever it might be. So they're immediately seeing a product right then, and then it might be two, six, to, two to six months later when the show is actually on the air. But so in my field, it's a little bit different because yeah, social media is very important, and I can tell you right now whether or not I like or dislike something. Um, or in New Zealand, I really like how they have heated towel racks or little things like that that make people feel like they can connect with me and my travels and as a host. But then they know that they can turn on and, and check my Facebook to see when that New Zealand show is going to air. So to me, it's important, but uh, the, the likes and the follows, as much as I'd like to have more, um, the distribution is what's really important in TV production. Yeah. And, and in terms of marketing right away, if, an, if as an online producer, you, let's say, you know, the, James, are you out? Yes. All right. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You guys. Tell Hollywood hello. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> Say hello to Tom and Still Katie and here, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the question is, how do you start to serve a resort or destination without it being a a endorsement because you're still a journalist or you're still a sort of independent voice but how do you prove your value and worth um, from the beginning and then with an article sort of what is the lifeline of proving your value do you, do you tweet about it right away when they say yes come stay with us like I'm so excited to go to Turkey I just got back uh, from a press trip in Puerto Rico and the uh, the hotel sponsored it and uh, you know, I was tweeting the whole time I was there, and that was actually the first time I'd ever done that. I just got on Twitter about six weeks ago, so um, and it's, it's kind of fun, to be honest, but at the same time, that shows value, and then people retweet it and whatnot, and, uh, but then when you get back, the story is what they're really after, so, you know, but you want to mention it, but not be like, you know, going crazy all over it, like, you know, you're just trying to say, hey, please invite me back, or, you know, I'll, you know, kiss your butt and then someone else will invite you back. Because we're all relying on you as a filter. So it can't just be all unicorns and roses. The most important exactly. thing is to be honest. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I piss PR people off all the time. But, you know, their <laughs> hotel cannot be perfect. Everything can't be perfect. I remember I stayed at a hotel, I think it was a Ritz, and I ordered a, a bottle of water to come up and it was $14.95. And I tweeted it. I was like, guess how much this costs? $14.95. You know, I get a knock on my door going, you can't tweet that. I'm like, you know, well, you, sh you can't be pricing it at $14.95. But, but on the other hand, some hotels, because they're so committed to social media being a marketing arm, would retweet back, should we reconsider our water prices? I mean, there are no, some hotels And actually, th this hotel was actually, they were right. And they, they didn't knock on the door. I was only joking. But you could tell at first they were upset. But, you know, the good hotels and the good PR people, they, they appreciate the feedback. Mm -hmm. Because it's actually having like a free consultant come in. And I just wrote an article, I was just in Singapore, and I'm just writing an article that's going to come out this week on one of the hotels. And I said, to tell you the truth, man, this place is tired. And it, it needs work. But it won't take that much time, but it needs work. And, but I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to tell my, my, you know, my friends or followers. You're out of business if you start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've yeah. you got you to call it the way it is. Mm -hmm. I think that's how people start to trust you. Like you said, just be honest, because that's kind of what you're based on. That's your reputation right there. Yeah, And I think that's the difference with TripAdvisor, where it's still kind of hidden. Could be your competitor writing something negative against you, and they have to fight to get it off. Um, I've had general managers that I've worked with in the past that used to write 20 great things about a specific hotel. And I'm like, that's not fair. But everyone else was kind of doing it. With you doing that and saying things like that, it's more, it's more honest, it's more, you know, it's more natural, and then with that hotel getting back to you, or that you know, PR company, things like that, it makes all the difference. Jeff, do you go back to the de destination and show metrics with, this is how many people tweeted about it, or this is how many people read it? Well, it depends if we're, we're going back and asking for something else. I mean, we do, we, we send them the articles when, when they're posted, but we don't necessarily, unless, unless an article is out of, out, out of the charts. Um, We'll just say, by the way, did you know this article got 20,000 know, hits on it? But normally speaking, 
Um, we have regular conversations with PR people. They generally are looking for the value of what, what, the, what the articles are. I mean, they ask for, for advertising rates so they can go back and equate it to advertising. So um, generally we're having those conversations, but we don't go out there and do it. But we, we do things a little bit differently because we don't actually report on things that are bad. So we look for good things. I, I feel like there are, there are enough things in this world that are, that are truly spectacular. Not, I don't want to waste the airwaves with, with bad news. So if there's something that's truly awful, we just don't report on it, whether we've been hosted or not. And we expect that the PR people are just going to understand that. And if they don't, then we don't want to work with them. Do you think that's a disservice to your followers? Um, they should know so they don't make the same mistake. But we wouldn't recommend it in the travel therapist. We we would just wouldn't report on it. You there's, just wouldn't write anything. There's maybe maybe Johnny and when we're like ten years old, like you like you, we and we have ten years behind us and we've done everything. Then we can sort of then do that. But I believe right now there's just so much stuff out there that we haven't reported on. That's great, you know that that we. And that, do. that actually is a more traditional approach. I mean, you're not going to see in El Traveler a bad review. Right. That's not what they're doing. Right. They're showing you something good. So let's talk about followers and Facebook. And um, Ashley, you said that you do have all of those things, but it didn't doesn't seem like an essential channel for you. Well, I mean, I would like it to be more of a source probably than it is, but um, I kind of look at it as a bonus. So if somebody, if I was going to go and do a show on a on a country, then. I, it's it's something extra that I'm doing because, like I said, we're we're multimedia journalists, so I can actually take my flip cam and do a tour in my room right then and there, and then post that on Facebook. And no, that's not what my show is going to look like at all. Nor is it in high definition or 3D. But it is something that the you know my followers and the people that do look up to me as a travel expert uh, that they can. Um, put themselves in that situation and see what they would get if they were to do that as well. So, I mean, it's great. And, and every, the cool thing is, is everybody, well, not everybody, but a lot of people have smartphones. And within the click of a button, no matter where you are in the world, whether you have a Wi-Fi connection or you bought your global plan, you can, you know, we are all around the world tweeting and writing where we are on Facebook and, and saying what we like or dislike. So, I mean, that's the beauty of it all is, I mean, I can. I know I have people that follow me, and let's say I stayed at this hotel and I didn't like it. When they look to plan their trip there, they're going to remember that one tweet that I said I did or did not like it, and be like, and at least do more research. I mean, the travel world isn't perfect, and we're all learning from it. So whether we write something good or we write something that's bad, I mean, I guess we could all look at it as a way of finding improvement. So I mean, it's not. Um, Everyone's going to have their ups and downs when traveling, so we can at least learn from them. And a lot of the bad experiences, you look back and you laugh at the most. So whether you're sharing that on Facebook or Twitter. Well, um, it allows you to have a real-time voice for your audience, yeah. and they crave that. But it also sounds like it's really a business card. I mean, you have over 20,000 followers on, on Twitter, Johnny Jet. So that's impressive. And hotels look at that, and that is your credibility when you go to them. So I mean, actually, it I get invited on some trips just on Twitter. They don't even want me to write. They're like, they just tweet. Just tweet. I, I did a actually a controversial cruise trip. I think it was two years ago. It was the first actual Twitter cruise. They invited ten journalists, and we had to write three tweets a day. And then at the end of the week, we're supposed to write a blog. But you could write about whatever you wanted. So it was great. And you know, again, I would, almost all the tweets were positive. But I, I would, I think I did post one bad tweet. But it wasn't, I wasn't knocking them. I'm not trying to like find something that's really bad. It's well, just you get that free water on the cruise ships. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I don't, know, I don't know if that's true. You don't. Really? No, you have to pay for the bottle of water. Really? Yeah. All right. You get free tap water. <laughs> it depends what cruise ship. Seaborne, you get the good stuff. Exactly. But so. Yeah. And, and Lee, you're, you're newer yeah. to the social media. How have you found it? Uh, well, I love Facebook. I just uh, realized kind of the value of the fan page and like getting more likes, kind of like you said, is a currency. And I just got on Twitter, like I said, about six, eight weeks ago, something like that. And 
you know, there's a lot of value to it. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I remember on the last press trip I went on, uh, they're like, well, you only have X amount of followers. I was like, well, I just started. I mean, you know, what can I do? Um, but it, there's a lot of currency to it. And, uh, and I have to say, I also agree with what you said before about Alexa being wrong. I, uh, I'm much more a fan of analytics, and that's kind of how you justify things. Uh, but without that, I mean, Twitter is great, Facebook is great, uh, you know, Tumblr, stumble upon all of them. Yeah. You know. But it doesn't necessarily mean, no matter how many followers you have, it's the quality. Mm -hmm. Some of them yeah. could be all, you know, ghosts or... How do you prove quality to a destination? I think they should, they should go through your list and they can find out. Like, Will oh, they take the time? Some of them. Or they can look on Twitter, you can find out who's retweeting you and stuff. If all the big editors or, or mm -hmm. newspaper magazines are, are yeah, Ashley. I find the most valuable followers the ones that are writing you those notes that say, um, "What was the name of that restaurant where you were spinning pizza in Rome?" And like when they're actually asking me stuff about specific things that I did, to me that's like it. I mean, that's it an doesn't engaged matter how many followers follower, I have. Yeah, yeah, because I feel like in some way, shape, or form, whether they just wanted to eat that pizza or not, they connected with it, and I feel like I did a service by showing them the best pizza place in Rome or something like that. At least they're going to go and have that experience, too. Yeah. Twitter, Twitter's like the old letters in a magazine. You know, you really, you really can connect with the editors, and you really, you really get to know the people who, who work at, at the, the brand. And I yeah. just feel like it's, it's, it's really beneficial. And it is interesting um, how some people have really adopted it and are using it as a customer service platform or as a customer support. And really, that's marketing. Even though they may be saying, sorry, you had trouble checking in if somebody tweets something bad, you know, someone will be down in the lobby in just a second. I mean, that is going out to Twitter. That's amazing that some hotels are doing this. On the flip side, some traditional media has not adopted a great strategy when it comes to online. Can you guys talk a little bit about where you think traditional media needs to go with digital? I think all traditional media should be getting having a digital voice. I mean, they don't necessarily want to fold their magazine or newspaper or whatever, but they need to have some kind of presence online. But talking about in the companies, let's say, for example, Virgin America, they do a great job with tweeting. Someone wrote once, they just tweeted that I was on a Virgin America, I'm on a Virgin America flight right now because they were using GoGo -Go Internet and that the flight attendant skipped them. So all of a sudden, one of their PR people was always monitoring the Twitter. They had the, they radioed the pilot, yep. had the flight attendant go back, and they said, I'm sorry, what did you want? I mean, that's service, and that's what they need to do. And if I ever ran a hotel or an airline, I would have a whole team just on Twitter and Facebook to make sure that everyone's happy and putting out fires. My short experience on Twitter, I, I find, like you said, that airlines are the most responsive generally, and they generally, a lot of them have a dedicated kind of assist, like Delta has an assist, uh, you know, Twitter feed or whatever that will respond to immediately to your, your tweets. And also, I think specific hotels are pretty good like that too, generally, especially of like a big uh, national chain or whatever, they'll have their own Twitter feed for that specific mm -hmm. hotel, and I think that they're pretty responsive as well. One one of my friends is a blogger, and he, land, he wrote, uh, it's Gary Arndt from Everywhere Trip. I think he wrote, I just landed in Fort Lauderdale. Where, where anyone recommend, recommend where I should stay tonight? And Rich Carlton emailed him right away and said, we're sending a car, just stay right there. <laughs> I mean, and that's... That's what 100,000 followers won't do. Yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> but that's the way to do it. If you're a company, they're smart. So if the key is eyeballs and followers and audience and subscribers, can everybody give sort of your top tip for how to build a qualified, robust audience? Just, if you want to start, you want to start following all the big guys, all the magazines, all the popular travel writers, follow them, interact with them, engage with them, go to conferences, meet them. You know, I'm going to start following all these guys now. You know, before I probably wouldn't follow this guy because he's a joker, <laughs> he has like 200 people. <laughs> he's <laughs> but, a freshman. But, but, you know, he just started out. But now I'll start following him, and I'll start retweeting him, and he'll start getting more. And I'm sure the same way. By him coming to conferences like this, I don't, I don't mean to say you're a joker. But he's from Connecticut, so I can do that. I can take it. <laughs> <laughs> but things like that. You need to, you need to get out there. When I, when I started out, I knew nobody. People used to laugh at me. I'd go to conferences, and I'm like, hey, I'm Johnny Jet. They're like, 
who the hell are you? <laughs> and still some people say that. But you just got to go out there and you got to make friends and show your face. It's yeah. relationships. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it keeps going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I think you also need to kind of, especially if you're starting to break into it too, is have a focus. So whether your luxury or your budget travel or you know your adventure travel, not just be everything. Because if you're everything, then you're nothing. You're nothing. Yeah. So if you have that specialty, I mean, then start following the people that would are in that realm. Otherwise, you're in no man's land and you're not going to receive anything back. You don't want to put all your eggs in one bucket, or basket, I should say. <laughs> it's, East, it's Easter time. Because, you know, let's say I have a lot of followers on Twitter, but let's say I get hacked, and then I'm gone. So you have to have a, something on Facebook, and you have to have a good following on a blog, and things like that. So you got to make sure that you have everything. It's kind of like your bank account. You, you just don't want to have one bank account. I find Facebook is is actually a little bit more challenging, and and it, you have to be a little bit more creative on Facebook. Whereas Twitter, like I'm a good caption guy, I can write captions really well, so Twitter is really easy for me. But but Facebook is a little bit more challenging because you've got to give people something. Um, maybe um, I approach it also from a business perspective. So I do contests a lot. And that's how, how I've been able to grow. Wait, sweepstakes? Yeah, sweepstakes. But I mean, you know, as you once said on your site to me, you can sign up for my newsletter and then after the contest, unsign up. Um, Wait, you, or you, yeah, you <laughs> tweeted something like, you can sign up for Travel Squire's contest and then after they pick it, if you don't like it, you can unsign or unsubscribe. But anyway, um, oh, oh, oh. But, but it's interesting that people do sign up for contests and you've got to work to keep them. It's, I'm just, it was funny that. <laughs> well, if you did say that, Johnny, I think, th I think that's interesting messaging because what you're saying to your audience is, I get it, you're overwhelmed, like you've got all these emails coming to your inbox, but you're interested in this one thing and you have permission to get out of my game and clean up my list for me because you're just going to delete my emails. And that's a great marketer. No, I, I, I think you should start following a bunch of people, give them a shot. Uh, all the time, every week I at least start following at least five new people. And if I don't like them, I just unfollow them, or even old ones. If they start telling me they're at Foursquare at the same Starbucks five days in a row or whatever, I'm going to unfollow them. Just because I'm not getting any value out of it. I'm, I'm, I only have a short amount of time I get on Twitter to try and to learn something. So I just, I just try and keep my list really tight. I'm not trying to be, you know, some, some of my best friends I've had to unfollow. And they're like, why are you unfollowing me? I'm like, I, you're I, uninteresting. I'm not saying anything. Kind of what Jeff was just saying about yeah. Facebook being more difficult. We were talking about this before the show. Uh, Facebook ads, uh, I find to be really well. I mean, again, this is all kind of new, the social media thing, but just in the last like three weeks, my following has doubled because of Facebook ads, which are really cheap also. So talk a little bit about how you have created ads because Facebook search and Google search are very different. Yeah. Um, I'm redoing my website and I just recently had a new logo. Um, so I use that as like my Facebook fan page, um, you know, little picture. And then you can create a caption and then you can target uh, which country and then you can put in keywords on Facebook. So like for me, I put in traveling, adventure travel, uh, you know, I put in backpacking, I put in hotels, you know, stuff like that, um, uh, skydiving, bungee jumping, stuff that I like to do and I like to write about. And it'll show you how many millions of people in those specific countries that fit into those niches for people who like that stuff. And uh, honestly, I mean, I've been getting like 50 a day uh, for the past like three weeks I've been doing it. It's it's been great. Mm -hmm. So I, I highly recommend that. Yeah. So the distinction is is if you were if you were optimizing um, keywords for your site, you would you would optimize stuff that people Google. But for Facebook, you would optimize things that people write about in their profile. Exactly. So it's it is a different sort of strategy. It's shocking how cheap it is too. And it's cheap because you can pay per click. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What else? What other stuff have you yeah, done? A new site a lot of people aren't really using it yet, or actually they are starting to use is Pinterest. How many, how many of you guys are on Pinterest? Yeah. So it's a good amount. And that's driving a lot of traffic. So what you want to, if you're a hotel or whatever, you definitely want to have be on Pinterest or any company. Are you guys on Pinterest? Uh, no, I haven't heard of it. So. Oh. <laughs> it's, so it's basically, you know, when you're growing up, you had these cork boards in your room and you cut out the magazines and put, you know, this is, you know, this is a dream house of mine. Yeah. So this is basically what you do on Pinterest. You can have as many boards as you want. You can label them any way. I have one for travel. I have one for cookies, snacks, hotels I've stayed in, you know, beautiful pictures, beautiful sunsets. And I can just, anything online I see, 
I can just take it and take the URL. If I go to Travel Square and there's an article on there, on, let's say on Capri, and I really like the photo, and it's important as a, uh, who, have, who has a travel website to have beautiful pictures on your website and a good size. You don't want to have anything small. So that way, people will put it in their Pinterest board so when they go to click it, it'll go right to your website. Mm -hmm. And it's driving a lot of traffic. And I hear it from a lot of people. And it's also driving traffic to, to Johnny Jet. And I just started a month ago. Yeah, I got a, actually an email from my friend Aaron over there the other day about uh, Pinterest and how it's such a traffic driver. I actually signed up for, uh, you know, to get an invitation or whatever. Because I clicked on my, I put in my blog name on Pinterest. And I saw that like hundreds of pictures from my website had been pinned. And I'm like, whoa, I should probably get involved in this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just another thing, though. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, great. So, I mean, what applies to social media and what applies to subscribers and what applies to approaching hotels and destinations are all sort of the same rules. Building relationships, being a trusted advisor or filter, uh, being f fresh mm -hmm. and having a point of view, specialization, have a, have a specialty, have a niche, really know what you're talking about in something specific. Have a personality. Have a personality. <laughs> have a personality. Please have a personality. <laughs> and, and it takes time. It's just not like, like trying to find a good airfare to New York. You're just not going to find it on one site. You've got to take time to research. So it's the same thing with building a following. It takes time. Well, you could have called James, but he yeah, left. Yeah. You, know. you could have called James. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jeff. Delivering on your promise is the other important thing, Absolutely. I think. I mean, if you say you're going to do something, do it, and then follow up on it. Because if you don't, that's, that's kind of... <laughs> Are you, are, when you're approaching someone, are you saying, here are all the things that we're going to do for you? I mean, a journalist wouldn't say that. No, but when you're, when you're, you're being invited somewhere, you say, I'm going to do a story. I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to let you influence that, but I'm going to do a story. And that's, I promise you, I'm going to do a story, and the story's going to come out. And that's, that, that's what I'm talking about. when I talk So about keeping your word is essentially publishing a story. Right. Them what I'm writing about, or if I'm going to do a video, or if I'm going to tweet. I mean, they just expect, you know, that I'll do my part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ashley. One thing too, just for uh, tourism boards or convention bureaus, or if someone's hosting someone. Um, one time I was told not to ask about certain things. So I was with some print journalists, and you know, it's completely different being with when you're a video production and you're with print journalists because we take 10 times as long. And, but again, they said they were gonna go and write an article. Well, if you're going to go and write an article and try to feature a country and tell the truth and be objective and, and do all the things that a journalist does, don't say not to ask about the politics. You know, the different things like that. So, I mean, that's just to, if there's any of you out there that, I mean, obviously sometimes you might not want a derogatory story, obviously no one would want that, but, um, when there is that kind of like, well, what's going on? You know, why can't I ask this? So, and that might only be one place, but. But there but are different kind of trips. But even tourism trips, you're talking about travel. I went to South Africa, and one of the guys in our group was from a hard magazine, and he kept asking everybody how much they made. You know, I'm talking about the locals, and it's not, you don't write about that. You don't, you, don't, you don't ask those kind of questions. And he's like, tell Wait, me about how your how much money they make. Yeah, and what their working conditions are like, and all that stuff, which is it's fine to do, but he not, on, not, not on a travel training. trip. <laughs> wow. So, just as sort of a final wrap up, where where are things going? I mean, what what can we look for in the industry? What are partnerships or relationships you're trying to forge to make everybody work together and support one another better? Both the online folks and the traditional folks, or those who serve the traditional travel industry. agree with Ashley where you know we deal with other like-minded you know individuals that want to stay at our four and five star hotels resorts chalets so we'll work with press media foodies spa goers that that stay at these type of properties you know there's nothing wrong with staying at the airport hotel there's nothing wrong with staying you know you're taking a road trip you're just pulling off and you're sleeping overnight that's totally fine that's just not our niche so we just, you know, really emphasize the type of partners that we work with and that we look for on these sites through Twitter, through social media, through Facebook, through the magazines. And what are the magazines that are going to work with us and other type of partners from there yeah. with our niche? And I think sticking with that so you don't, you know, try to be everything to everyone. Yeah, and that's really important to know as somebody who's approaching you, 
you're not looking for somebody who specializes in Marriott's. That's not your that's not your clientele. You want somebody who specializes in boutique hotels, really refined, unique experiences, a lesser known uh, property, word perhaps. Of mouth, exactly. Word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. yeah, Johnny. I think uh, you know. I think everyone's going to have their own social network. You know, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube channel. I think is going to be big. I think everyone needs to have video on their site and their blogs. It's basically going to be. I mean, soon I'll be wearing a, a webcam on my head. <laughs> so I feel like you'd look good with a webcam on your head. Well, hide my eight head, because I don't have a forehead. I, th I think Ashley said it best before. It's all about multimedia. Like, I'm starting to do more video. I've been doing work with Trip Films and doing some stuff on YouTube, and I think that's really where it's going. It's the most important thing. It makes you the most marketable. I think it's good to have a, a blog or a website, and, and certainly Twitter and Facebook, as a reference, but I think video is where it's at. I mean, you look at some of these things that go viral. Uh, it's really incredible how many people see that. You know, it's hard to get an article to go viral, really. So I think. Are there tips for making things go viral? You gotta do something cool. <laughs> <laughs> Good content. <Yeah. laughs> you never know what's gonna. You, yeah, you, never, you, know. you never, know. never know. My most popular article last week, and I almost didn't even write it. It just took me a minute. Was uh, our Canada, our Canadian um, border patrol, the worst? They are the worst. They are the worst, and that's what I wrote. And. BBC retweeted it. Uh, all these big companies. Nothing like it. a common enemy. Yeah. <laughs> Canada and Israel, the two worst yeah. for borders. I agree. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Jeff, I think it's staying on top of the technology. I mean, as as everything evolves, and there'll be another thing that's next after Twitter, and it's sort of Pinterest, maybe it um, is sort of picking up on that. It's keeping your your site, if you have a site, um, kind of. Uh, up to date, like uh, adding maps, adding iPad applications, whatever the next thing is, is just staying on top of it and being there so that your readers continue to stay with you. Um, if you don't progress as the market progresses, then people will leave you right away. They're, they're, people are fickle and they, they move on pretty quickly. And as everybody knows, there are so many places to get travel information. So as you build, you keep, you get, and you get the trust, you have to give them more. And you're in an industry that's growing, not shrinking. It's so, industry. yeah, it's and more competition, business. more personalities. Ashley? Well, I obviously think video is, if not the one of the most important things, because even television is going to the web. So um, in the future, we have a lot to look forward to and a lot of change. But, um, you know, in my field, like right now, marketing a series that I just finished, you know, Part of me is like, well, do I even put it on networks or do I just have it go to the web? Because people want to see it then, they want to see it now. They have Hulu, they have Netflix, they have all these different things. So, I mean, obviously, there's always going to be new media, keyword new. I mean, something, I went to Croatia, came back, and someone asked me if I had Pinterest, and I didn't know what it was. So, I mean, I was behind all of it, and I think that I'm pretty tech savvy, but um, everyone's going to be better at different things. Facebook is actually what I like the best um, when it comes to social media because I feel that I like to have albums and I like things to be organized a certain way where Twitter is just a little bit too much for me and I'm not very good at it, but I still have it because somebody might have a Twitter account that doesn't have Facebook and I still can connect with that person. So, yeah. it's a new wave. Well, everybody has been fascinating. Such good tips, great information. Really appreciate the point of view that everybody brought on a topic that's really changing all the time. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Jet Set Extra, for hosting this incredible conversation. And thank you all for coming out in LA on Oscar night, braving traffic, and for looking so fabulous. Thank you. Thank you.